Hi, everyone. I would like to welcome you to our webinar this afternoon, Case File Review Confidentiality Requirements for SARTs. My name is Heather Blanton. I'm the National SART Program Coordinator with the Sexual Violence Justice Institute at the Minnesota Coalition Against Sexual Assault. With me today is Carol Schrader. Carol, would you like to introduce yourself? Thanks, Heather. I'd be glad to welcome everyone. I'm excited to be here today with you to talk about this important topic. I am a technical assistance attorney at the Victim Rights Law Center, where I provide support to attorneys and non-attorney legal advocates. And I also manage our direct representation team in Oregon, where we provide sexual assault legal representation. Awesome. Thank you, Carol. There are a few logistical items I would like to cover really quick before we move on. First, we do have live captioning available today. And to access the captions, you'll click on the live transcript icon at the bottom of your screen and select show subtitle. If you have any difficulty accessing the captions, please reach out to our staff who has identified with the name tech support. Secondly, we will be utilizing the chat box today. So feel free to pop any questions or comments that you might have into the chat box. Um, also, if you would like to ask a question directly to any one of the trainers, or if you have a question that you would like to keep anonymous, you may also use the Q&A function as well. Okay, in today's webinar, we will be defining systems change, describing the three phases of systems change, and discussing where case file review fits into this model. We will be explaining what case file review is and identifying the four stages of the case file review process. We will also be identifying confidentiality requirements for the case file review process as well. Preparation of this material was supported by the Office on Violence Against Women, U.S. Department of Justice. The opinions, findings, and conclusions expressed are those of the presenters and do not necessarily represent the views of the U.S. Department of Justice. So we have a lot of folks on the webinar today from a wide variety of backgrounds and professions. So if you would take a minute and chat in, how comfortable are you with case file review? Has your sexual assault response team participated in the case file review process before. Um, maybe your team is considering this process and that's what brought you here to this webinar today. We would like to get the temperature of what brought you here today and how comfortable are you with the case file review process. We'll give folks a couple minutes to chat in. Okay, so folks are considering starting the process. Some not very comfortable, but have been doing mock case reviews. Awesome, yeah, we'll talk a little bit more about um, doing the mock case file review process a little bit later on. Okay, moderately comfortable, need more experience. Okay, we have some that have done this process at least once before, preparing to maybe do another one here soon. Great. So it looks like we have a variety of experience on this webinar. So my hope for today is that we can all really learn from each other and draw on each other's experiences as we walk through this presentation. Thank you all for chatting in. Okay, creating systems change. It really means working towards improving individual systems response to sexual violence, while also working towards increasing collaboration between systems. So a community's response to sexual violence is comprised of a web of very interconnected systems, all with very distinct processes and goals. And so as we talk about systems change today, we're talking about this work and it can look a lot of different ways. Systems change work can involve improving individual systems response. So 
really looking at how our agencies work internally to dismantle the systemic barriers to the services that we provide. Um, increasing collaboration between systems. So, for example, maybe looking at how advocates and law enforcement can strengthen their collaboration and work better together. Enhancing strengths of practice, policy, procedures, and collaboration. This could be enhancement of strength between different organizations or within your own. Addressing shortcomings. So not only looking for gaps in services, but also practicing introspection, which sometimes is, is really hard to do, but really looking within our own agencies as well for areas of improvement. Ensuring support and engagement for victims throughout all processes. So are we listening to the voices that are most impacted? We are doing this work while also working towards a continuous improvement. We're always assessing our work and looking for ways that we can further develop the work that we are doing. The process of systems change is cyclical. And some of you may be familiar with this graphic, but Mincasa uses a three-phase cycle to describe the systems change process. We're gonna dive a little bit deeper into each one of these phases over the next couple of slides. So in phase one, we're looking at assessing the status quo. So this means we are looking at the situation as it currently exists. And this can be done in multiple ways, such as bringing the voices of victims and survivors um, to the forefront or conducting a community needs assessment. But ultimately, you're really looking at answering the question, what does the response process currently look like? And I think sometimes as responders or community agencies, we think we already know what the current response is in our community, but victims and survivors, and even though other community members may have a better representation based on their own experiences in the system, and they may be able to kind of shed a little bit more light on what is actually going on in our community. We're also looking at how our disciplines work together and identifying ways that we can close gaps and break down barriers within and in between systems. So one way that I like to think about this phase in particular is that we really need to know where we come from in order to know where we are, where we are going. So developing that starting point and really working towards that next goal is going to be pivotal at this initial phase. So leading into phase two, which is make change. And during this phase, your team is really analyzing all of that information that you collected in that first phase. You're digging deep to identify those gaps and barriers in service provision, where there may be points of tension or conflict, and then you're looking at the quality of the overall response. And if you had brought in voices for, of the victims and survivors um, in that first phase, you may have discovered significant areas where there are gaps in the system. But you can then use that information to really bring about relevant training opportunities, not only for your team, but also for other community agencies as well. And even if you didn't bring in victim survivor voices in that first phase, this would be a good time where we encourage bringing their voices to the table particularly around the development and revision of interagency protocols and procedures and making sure that those voices are being heard at that stage. And the third phase is measure the change. This phase is vital to the change process. And it's also one of the phases that gets neglected a lot of the time. So for those of you who may find evaluation process fun or interesting, this is the stage where you really get to look at how the changes are working. So for example, once you put a new protocol in place, you're gonna want to know if it's working the way that it's supposed to, right? Does the change make the process easier for victims and survivors? Are all the system professionals able to respond effectively? Are there any sort of unintended consequences to the changes that you made? And case file review is really that evaluation-based process, right? Um, which is why it's listed under this third phase, measure the change. And case file review 
can be a very helpful tool for a sexual sexual response team, but also it definitely has its limitations, which we will cover briefly here in just a little bit. So what is case file review? It's the systematic process of examining case files and identifying themes within the criminal legal response to determine compliance with or deviance from established policies and protocols. Case file review can also include a determination of gaps and barriers to effective community response to sexual assault. So the case file review process is really examining how responders are guided to include some information and yet not other information in those case files. And teams have many different reasons why they might want to review cases, such as maybe they want to evaluate current policies and practices of SAR agencies. Maybe they want to identify um, and implement strategies for sexual assault cases to be more successfully investigated and prosecuted. Um, but regardless of the why, um, the process is typically the same. And I think it's important here to also make the distinction before we go any further that this evaluation method is not a performance review for a specific individual or even an organization but rather the case file review gives teams an overall perspective of the response to sexual assault between disciplines in their community. So with that being said, and we'll talk a little bit more about this later, but it is recommended that all identifying information, including the names of any law enforcement officers, um, medical forensic examiners, advocates, prosecutors, and any other professionals that may be mentioned in the case file are redacted or removed from the text analysis. Um, <clears throat> and later in the webinar, we will talk more about the importance of ensuring that confidentiality and how a team will also need to agree to guidelines about discussing specific elements of the case that are uh, not documented in the text and other potentially identifying information. Okay, so there are four stages to the review process. Foundation, preparation, case file review, and findings and recommendations. So on average, SARTs can often spend a year or more on the full review process. A good estimation is probably to expect to spend around 10 to 15 months from start to finish. Um, this process requires a significant investment of time and energy. So it's also really important for your team to identify a timeline to not only try and help stay on track, um, but also recognizing that in that timeline, there may be the need for um, that timeline to shift, especially if the team is needing a break or, um, you know, certain things pop up that you were not necessarily expecting at the beginning of that timeline. Um, one thing in particular to, to kind of put in that timeline is to allow sufficient time to discuss key principles, such as team members' confidentiality requirements and the impact of those requirements on the case file review process itself. <clears throat> so this is a learning process all the way through, and it's important to provide enough time within that timeline for that learning to occur. So we will explore each one of these four stages of the review process here over the next few slides. So stage one is foundation. And this stage is really focused on assessing the interest and readiness of your team to do this work. So some questions you might ask your team could be, does your SART have established protocols? So a SART protocol is a written response that agencies will often refer to and use when responding to victims of sexual assault. And protocols are good because they help formalize roles and responsibilities for all responders. And they guide not only how each agency responds, but also how agencies are going to interact with each other to meet victim needs. So if your SART already has established protocols, this case file review process may be a strategy for assessing gaps in that existing response. And if your SART does not already have protocols in place, 
your SART can definitely still consider this process. However, proceeding into the case file review may present some unique challenges that should also be addressed. So for example, case file review may require more time for team members to understand uh, the roles and responsibilities of each agency, as well as the reasons behind how and why agencies may respond in a certain way. So you can also ask, has your SART discussed each discipline's role? So do all members understand the function and the mission of the team? Has the SART normalized ways of working together and discuss these norms openly? So for example, a norm may be to be respectful in how you share your feedback or comments. If these norms are not already in place, they will definitely need to be explored as part of the case file review process. Another question could be, has your SART built trust between members for this process? The case file review process can definitely bring out some tension and conflict within the group. So really thinking through how you might address issues if and when they arise. Are members of law enforcement and or prosecution willing to allow their specific agency's case files to be reviewed within the SART? So it's imperative that law enforcement and prosecution leaders are allies in this process and that they understand the vision of case file review. Additionally, there needs to be that trust between the agency that's supplying the case files and the coordinator or the facilitator of this project. And if that's not the case, if that trust is not there, the ramifications of pushing this uh, could be very detrimental to future working relationships. So that's definitely something you want to pinpoint and figure out before you, you move forward in this process. Does your SART have the time required to complete this process? So as I mentioned on the previous slide, this process could take close to a year or more. So does your SART currently have the time, the capacity, and the resources to dedicate to this process? During this stage, teams are also thinking about their why. So really thinking about why do we want to do case file review? What is the purpose? And some teams may have a specific goal in reviewing case file review, while others may hope to review cases in a much more generalized way. But this anchor question will be extremely important to refer back to as you work through the case file review process to really keep you grounded in your why. So through the process of answering these questions, teams will be able to see whether their team is ready to do case file review. And if your team is not ready for that type of review yet, that's totally okay. There are many other forms of evaluation your team can look into. And we're gonna go ahead and put a a great resource in the chat called, Are We Making a Difference? And this toolkit can really help teams um, better identify which form of evaluation may be most appropriate for them at this time. Okay, so moving on to stage two, which is preparation. The SAR is really laying the groundwork for the actual case file review during this stage. So by creating a shared language, at this stage, uh, the team can also help focus on developing shared definitions for common terms that are used during the review. So for example, having a shared definition of what you mean by consent, sexual violence, underserved communities, for example. Having that shared language will help ensure that the team also has a shared understanding of that terminology moving forward. The team will then create a guide for the agency around selection of cases. So this will include the type of case, the number of cases, and case status. So for example, the type of case being, being reviewed, um, such as, you know, let's say for instance, your team wants to look at um, intimate partner sexual violence cases. The selection of the type of cases, that does not necessarily need to be in place to begin this process. However, if you're trying to get law enforcement leadership on board with case file review, having a discussion with them about which cases should be included may definitely help create that trust and reciprocity. 
Also, because this is an evaluation method, um, you must include a high enough number of cases to review in order to identify those themes in the response. So a sample size that is large enough to produce themes is really all that is needed. And here at SBJI, we've worked with teams who have found themes with as little as 20 cases and with teams who have conducted reviews with as many as 45 cases. So deciding on a number that is high enough to produce those themes, but not too high that it will overwhelm the SART. Another area to explore is case status. So will your cases um, be closed or open? And here at SVJI, we do strongly recommend only including um, closed cases to start your review. Um, and focusing on those closed cases may also help relieve a lot of the concerns um, that law enforcement may have about reviewing their cases. So this typically means these cases are ones that law enforcement has already made an arrest in the case or has referred the case on to prosecution and the prosecutor has filed charges and the court case has been resolved through um, like a plea deal or a trial. So teams um, during this time are also brainstorming agreements and guidelines they would like to include as they go through the case file review process. So an example of this could be allowing space for different voices and opinions to be heard. So if you are someone who tends to speak up more, you can move up into the role of listening more. And on the flip side, if you are someone who has the tendency to listen more, working on moving up into the role of speaking up more. Teams are also going to be discussing the confidentiality standards of their team and working to develop a plan as to how, how can they uphold these standards through this process. Confidentiality requirements vary based on discipline, state statutes, tribal law, territorial law, grant funding requirements. And sometimes just even um, individual organizational policies. So it's it's really important to have this information as you move forward. So all members of the team know what they can and cannot be shared with the team. And Carol will definitely go more in depth on the ins and outs of confidentiality a little later in this presentation. So I'll leave that to her. Um, but it may be helpful also during the preparation stage to um, practice the case file review process by completing a mock case file review. And so I'm happy to see that some of you had already um, created that mock case file review process and have taken um, that opportunity. But Mincasa, we also have a case file review toolkit on our website and we'll go ahead and put that here in the chat so all of you can access that. But it provides you examples of a mock case file review if you would like to practice this with your team and to really test out your team's preparation for this type of work. It's also a great way to see an example of a case file that has already been redacted. So um, I also wanna just note here that we actually just revised and updated the toolkit to really include more practical skills for the team um, to help you walk through this process. However, the new revised toolkit will not launch until I believe February of 2023. So that's definitely something to be on the lookout for. But by really taking the time and care to prepare for the review, teams are better able to focus on more closely reviewing their community's response to sexual violence. And you're really setting yourself up here um, for better success. So moving into stage three, the case file review. This is where the actual work of reviewing the case file takes place. Typically, teams can achieve this stage within one to three full consecutive days, or uh, sometimes teams will decide to just set aside time in their monthly meetings to work on the case file review. But as mentioned before, the case file review is an evaluation process based on qualitative data gained from written reports. And the text that the team is exploring is gonna come from law enforcement or a prosecutor's office in the form of some sort of case documentation and notes. So for this documentation to exist, the victim and survivor 
must report that the assault to law enforcement, and it may include information also from a medical forensic exam. So with that being said, there are limitations to case file review. So evaluating sexual violence that is not documented by the criminal legal system. So as we just discussed, documentation must currently exist. This occurs when the victim and survivor reports to law enforcement. The next limitation is evaluating organizational responses to sexual violence based outside of the criminal legal system. So the case file review um, process is really assessing the response from within the criminal legal system. So for example, this process would not look at um, advocate agencies, for instance. And the third limitation is evaluating individual members of a discipline who are part of the response to sexual violence. So this process is evaluating the system's response. And again, we're not, we're not looking at any individual response. So during case review, SARTs um, are examining closed cases to really identify those gaps and successes of the system response, as well as to measure the effectiveness of interagency protocols. So when this is done effectively, case review helps the team to identify those patterns and gaps that may not have been obvious at the time of the case. And this can result in potential changes to policy, training, and procedure, for example. And as I mentioned before, the case file review process examines how the responders are guided to include some information and not other information in their cases. So this can also provide insight into those potential gaps and areas where the case files could be stronger or communication between the system could have been stronger. And I think it's also important at this stage to also make note of things that are being done well. Um, in addition to those things that need to change. And let's not focus only on the negative, but also including those successes is also really important. And there are a couple different ways um, that SARTs choose to complete this case file review process. So some SARTs decide that the entire team will be part of the review process. Other SARTs create um, a subcommittee or a smaller subset of the larger team that will be the group that looks at the cases, and then takes all of the findings back to the larger group to really develop those themes and recommendations. So there's not a one size fits all for this process. So I encourage you to do what works best for your team. And the last stage is findings and recommendations. So this is where teams are agreeing on themes uh, identified in the review and they're interpreting that information. So next this art will turn those interpretations into recommendations that can strengthen and improve the response in the future. Um, teams can then create a plan to act on those recommendations in the future to create change in their community response to sexual violence. So one thing that I do think is important to note here is that we want to make sure that each team member gets to review the recommendations and the action plans to ensure that they accurately reflect the results of the findings. So after reviewing the documents, team members should present them to the agency administrators uh, to assess the level of commitment that that team can expect from that agency in particular in accomplishing the goals and or the support um, to support the direct efforts of the agency. So I am going to go ahead and turn this over to Carol to get the conversation started on confidentiality. Thanks, Heather. Uh, next slide, please. So um, when thinking about the confidentiality responsibilities and roles with case file review, the extent to which the SART has any um, any requirements or expectations, it's based on the individual members of that SART team. So, um, and as Heather mentioned earlier, in the foundation stage, it's important to understand something about each individual member's responsibility. So 
the different professionals, if they're nurses or district attorneys or victim advocates, for example, they're trained differently and have a different understanding of how they engage with the people who they advocate for or serve. And they have different experiences with the people they serve. There are different legal and professional requirements for their work, and each has their own authority and responsibility. With that, each person on the SART has a really important role, not only with the SART, but with the legal system as a whole and with the network within the community of how those professionals engage with survivors. Next slide, please. So I would like you to please use the chat to answer the question, why should a SART care about survivor confidentiality as they're engaging in case file review? Why is that confidentiality important? It's the law. Yes, there are laws around confidentiality. That's that's a reason to care. What other, what other reasons? To protect and respect and honor the survivor, yeah. Um, you don't know where there are conflicts. Um, respect for them, is that, yeah, for the survivors, yeah? Yep, yep, yep. Um, safety, protect them, lots of different examples of safety. So we've got some respect, safety, um, avoid further injury, and then also maintain trust between agencies because if you have that trust, you're gonna better be able to serve survivors. Honoring the stories, they get to tell their own stories. Survivors get to control their narrative and their information. Um, yeah, these are great reasons about why SARTs need to care about that. I think for me, one I'll add, which brings in some of those that you've said, the extent to which we are collectively part of a violence abolition movement, part of that, um, movement is to make sure that people get to give consent, consent for how their bodies are engaged with, consent for how their information is shared. So it's philosophically really important. Um, and uh, there can also be legal liability. Uh, I'm sorry that you all can't see the chat responses, it looks like. I don't know if that's true across the board or not. Um, so um, I, I, I think I've summed up sum them up well for you. Next slide, please. To um, further engage with this topic, we're going to look through a scenario. So um, Heather, if you could just move through the slide as I touch on the point. This scenario involves Anna there too. Um, Anna uses they, them pronouns. The team that we're talking about in these are a community coordinated community response team or a sexual assault response team doing case file review. LEA and LEO refer to law enforcement agencies or law enforcement officers. The victim advocate referenced in the scenarios is a VAWA funded sexual assault advocate providing victim services. Next, yeah, thanks. Um, these scenarios are used, next line please. Um, we're talking about these things before we've addressed the topic. So I just want to be clear, I don't have any expectation that you're giving a right answer or a correct answer. There's no judgment involved around your questions and the answers that you give to questions. And lastly, um, ask questions as we go. Um, so next slide, please. The scenario is that Anna, that a law enforcement officer has brought Anna's closed case to your team for case file review today. The officer shares a signed written release from Anna that allows all team members to freely discuss all information about Anna's case. During the team conversation, the officer asks a local victim advocate if Anna ever came to them for services, and if so, what did Anna tell them about their sexual assault? May the advocate share this information. Um, next slide, please, and please launch the poll. Okay, may the advocate share this information when asked by the officer? The first option is yes. The officer brought a written release signed by Anna allowing the team to discuss all information about Anna's case. Second possibility, maybe. Does the advocate have a separate release from Anna allowing the advocate to share information? And the third option is no, freely discuss all information is not specific enough to be an informed release of information. So please indicate what you think is the best answer. 
I will let Heather and Nigel know that at this point, I'm not seeing the responses. So I will need to rely on you for that. Heather, are we getting responses? Oh, yep, it looks like it just ended. Oh, a couple more people coming in. We actually have 12% um, said yes. 45% um, said maybe. And 44% said no. Okay. Um, I'm closing the poll. Oh, you got it. Thank you. Um, oh, great. I can see it. I hope everyone can see oh, it. Um, so uh, I agree with most of you that maybe or no is the better answer. And we're going to talk about why um, in the moments ahead. So I am done with that poll, thank you, and would like to have the next slide. So what do we mean when we're talking about confidentiality? Um, and especially in the context of SART's work together. I think uh, the first thing is to know that when I'm talking about confidential information, I mean, that's information that's shared in this context between a survivor and a professional, and it's not intended for further disclosure. That's confidential information. It can be conversations, it can, there can be records that are confidential. And confidentiality then is the obligation that professionals have not to share this confidential information of someone who has come to them in their professional capacity. This can be a legal expectation. It can be an ethical expectation, which may be legal. Um, it can be an expectation that an organization has. Next slide, please. As Heather alluded to earlier, there are various sources of confidentiality law, and many of you referenced this in the chat earlier. Um, tribal law can be a source of confidentiality uh, expectations. You need to check about that for where you work. There are hundreds of tribes in the country and you may be engaging with people who are affiliated with more than one where you work. Just a reminder that sometimes tribal law isn't written down somewhere. You're not necessarily gonna be able to Google it and find the code. Some of it is captured in oral tradition. We're gonna talk more about federal law in just a second, but I also wanna flag that there's state territorial and law in the District of Columbia that we're not gonna be able to be specific about today, but you should feel free to reach out to me if you have questions about how any of this works where you work. Um, Nigel, I know we were gonna do this later, but if you have it at the ready, I would love for you to put up our resource, the Victim Rights Law Center's resource request form um, at, at this moment or whenever you're able to. I wanna let the rest of you know that there are certain resources I'm going to mention as I'm talking with you today, as we're talking together about confidentiality on SARTS, thank you, Nigel, um, that you can request through our resource request form. And one of those is that we have jurisdiction specific laws on privacy in general, on privacy that, focus on, that focuses on minors. We have some um, information that we can share with you on how this works when you're ser serving elders or adults with disabilities and how this works with um, clergy. Next slide, please. With federal confidentiality law, there are a lot of sources. Many of you mentioned the Violence Against Women Act, VAWA. Others of you may receive funding from the Victims of Crime Act, VOCA, and the Family Violence Prevention Services Act, FIPSA. Um, there are also health and education related laws like HIPAA and the Family Education Rights and Privacy Act, FERPA, Title X, Title IX, the Clary Act. And lastly, I want to highlight for those of you who are working on SARTs and communities that have prisons and jails and detention facilities, the Prison Rape Elimination Act also has some co confidentiality related provisions that impact facilities and their work. Next slide, please. The last federal law I want to touch on is Brady v. Maryland. Often it's referred to by, as Brady. Um, there are Brady requirements. It was a Supreme U.S. Supreme Court case decided in 1963 that established that the prosecution in a criminal case must turn over to the defendant all evidence that might exonerate the defendant upon the defendant's request. The implication of that decision is 
that information shared with victim assistance working in a district attorney's or law enforcement agency, for example, should be assumed to be disclosed to the defendant or the defense team. Um, so that's something to think about. Um, and then also, I just want to flag that public records laws also come in to play when we think about information sharing in SARTs. Next slide, please. One of the, we're going to turn to VAWA confidentiality, which also tends to apply to VOCA and FIPSA funded victim service providers. If you're receiving more than one of these funds are otherwise interested in knowing the specific differences between the confidentiality requirements with these three sources of funding or the laws that govern the funding, uh, we have a chart that lines them up. And uh, you can feel free to ask for that during with the resource request form. Next slide, please. So with VAWA confidentiality, the Violence Against Women Act confidentiality, which governs funding from the Office on Violence Against Women, requires or states that grantees and subgrantees shall not disclose personally identifying or individual information collected in connection with services requested, used, or denied. And I want to say we're talking about this um, for those members of a SART who receive this funding. It's important for everyone on the team to know what those expectations are for protecting personally identifying information if you're receiving this funding for victim services. Next slide, please. There are three situations in which you can share personally identifying information if you're receiving this money for victim services. The first is if you have written and informed consent. The second is if there's a, there is a statutory mandate, that means there's a statute that requires you to release it. And the last is a court mandate. We're going to talk about all three of these, starting with the written and informed consent. But before we do so, next slide, please. Let's talk a little bit about what do we mean by personally identifying information. Please advance the animation. Personally identifying is information is anything that you might find on it. Just the one for a moment, please. Thanks. Is the um, is any information you might find on a driver's license, such as a picture of someone, their name, their address, their driver's license number, their date of birth, um, those sorts of things. It can also be uh, the sorts of things that are reveal who's communicating electronically. And lastly. Um, BAWA says that personally identifying information is any other information, including someone's birth date, racial or ethnic background, or religious affiliation that would serve to identify any individual. Also information likely disclose the location of a victim. Next slide, please. So we're going to start by looking at those ways in which information can be shared. Um, and so the first of those is release of information. I think so often we think about releases of information as this form, this piece of paper, or this electronic document that we have that allows us to release information. But BAWA statutes and regulations actually set up a process that is required for people who receive this funding. Next slide, please. That process starts with advance one step, please. Uh, requires a discussion about why the information might be shared, who would have access to that information, and what information might be shared. Next lines, please. Thanks. And then the VAWA funded program, the OVW funded program, and the person who has the information need to agree about two of those things. What information is going to be shared with whom, if that's what this person wants to have happen? There doesn't need to be agreement about why the information might be shared. And then third bit, please. Then the person who would be releasing the information and the person whose information who's going to be released need to record that agreement and the person whose information is being released needs to sign it. There's nothing that says that has to be on a piece of paper with a pen, electronic documents, electronic signatures are within the scope of what is required. And this process is why in our scenario earlier, Anna needed 
to have their own release because Anna needed to have this conversation and make sure there was agreement and recorded in writing and why the release brought by the law enforcement officer wasn't sufficient. Next slide, please. There are further requirements for people who receive this funding. The first is that there needs to be informed consent from the person whose information is being released. And that informed consent requires that the implications for the release be understood. Like if you're not a mandatory reporter and you're releasing information to a mandatory reporter, making sure the person understands that the person to whom you're releasing will be able to protect that information differently, which may mean they will protect it less, that it will be more available to more people than um, the advocate in this scenario could provide. Next line, please. The release needs to be specific in scope and have limited circumstances. And this is why um, on our scenario, when Anna allowed the law enforcement officer to tell the SART that they could freely discuss all information, that was not a VAWA compliant release, even if it had been in a conversation with uh, the funded victim, the VAWA funded victim services provider because it wasn't specific. It was everything for all time, essentially. You know, that sort of language isn't specific enough. Next line. No blanket releases are allowed. What this means is that an advocate wouldn't be able to say, hey, sign and date this. We'll fill in the rest later. It will save you a trip. Next line. It has to need, be for a specific and reasonable period of time that the release will be in effect. Next line. It needs to be revocable. So that means that the person who released the information can call, it doesn't have to be in writing or write in or however they want to communicate that they changed their mind and they don't want any information that has not yet been released to be released. The last two lines, please. Uh, it can't be a condition of service and it needs to be written and signed. So these are all requirements that the members of your team who receive OVW or OVC funding for sure um, have with some little differences, which again, if you want to, you should request that chart and you can see exactly what they are. Um, I'm gonna, on this next slide, please, I just wanna highlight that there are different signature requirements for these releases. And if you could just um, reveal all the lines on this slide, please, that would be great. There are four of them. Uh, so just so you to know that there are requirements for who signs a release, I think for today, we won't um, go into those. Next slide, please. And then uh, briefly on this one. So when we were looking at the scenario about Anna, next slide, please. And we um, were looking at those options. I hope it makes sense now why the maybe or the no are the better answers to this question. And it will depend on what exactly happens within those scenarios, which is the best answer. Next slide, please. So quickly with the statutory mandate where that's gonna come up uh, is typically with mandatory reporting or if someone on the team has a duty to protect or warn in the cases of uh, harm to a third party or suicide. Next slide, please. Court mandate, which next slide is a court order or case law that requires the release. Um, next slide, please. So for our next scenario, we have during your team's case file review, one member of your team is frustrated that another member of the team is not sharing much concrete information about how the organization was involved with a string of high profile sexual assaults in the community. How might your team approach this dis disagreement about how to proceed? Next slide, please, and the related poll launched. Thanks. How might your team approach this disagreement about how to proceed? You could ask the person who requests the information how that information would support the team's work and those outcomes and missions and goals you established as you were setting it up. Ask the person who is not sharing the information why they aren't sharing it. Any member of the team could remind the team how the information supports the team's purpose, <coughs> excuse me, and or any limits the team members may have with sharing the information 
all of the above. What do you think is the best answer? Heather, I'm gonna rely on you to help me navigate this because at this point I can't see it. Okay, it looks like we still, folks are still answering the poll. Thank you. Okay. It's still moving. I'm gonna give it a few more seconds. While you're doing that. Has a chance. Thank you. Um, while you're doing that, I wanted to answer a question I see in the chat. Is the ROI required if case reviews are redacted? Great question. So the, the release of information is only required for victim service providers who are releasing personally identifying information. So, so my response to this question is generally, it will depend on who is releasing the information. Is it one of those people and if it's redacted so that no personally identifying information is being shared, then that would not require a release. You need to be super careful that there isn't any personally identifying information because if everyone knows who you're talking about or anyone knows who you're talking about because they engaged with this victim, then, um, then you are releasing personally identifying information, which you may not do if you're receiving this funding. Um, uh, release of information forms. I, we at VRLC have release of information forms that are VAWA approved that you can request on that form. Okay, so what do we have? Okay. I, can you see the results, Carol? I can. Thanks okay. for asking. Sorry, I should have told you that. Yes. Um, so I think that all of these are ways to approach this particular scenario. So I personally like all of the above best, but um, I think any of them would help you communicate if done respectively and not like with a, why can't you share that with us kind of attitude, but just an openness. Like, can you say more about why you're not sharing that information? I think that can be really helpful. Uh, I'm done with the poll, thank you. And I would love the next slide. Given all this, we're, um, to briefly, would you identify how team members' confidentiality requirements are coming up in your team's case file review work, those of you who have been engaged with that, please, the sorts of issues briefly, um, just issue spotting them. How does this come up? How does this all come up with your work? Thanks, Nigel, for that reminder to make sure that the blue box above the chat box says everyone and not just hosts and panel, panelists if you want to see responses. In rural areas, even without names, it is hard. Yes, everyone knows everyone. So you can say a little bit of a thing like when this assault happened and everyone knows who you're talking about. Um, we haven't been able to create a release form for a team approach that our legal services is happy with. Well, that's, that's frustrating, and I'd be glad to talk with you about that if that would help. Um, healthcare and advocates who have stricter requirements. Yeah, there are different requirements that nurses and advocates have. Um, the victim advocates ROI doesn't necessarily expire after one year. Remember, it has to be tailored to what is needed. So it could either be shorter or it could be longer as long as someone can arguably say this is why it needs to be a certain length. So I think that one year thing has come up somehow in our narrative about how we do this work, but there's not anything in the law that requires that. So I hope that helps you think about other ways to do it. Um, yeah, I think that it can. people can struggle with the inability to share information. And I think, I hope that's getting easier and better for you as you do this work. I think it's some, a bit of it that we need to 
be assertive and confident in our responsibility as advocates and victim and service providers and to um, embrace that it's just like attorney client privilege or physician position physician patient privilege and uh, that there are confidentialities expectations that come with our professional status. Um, yeah, I think sometimes advocates have to speak in general terms to not to protect that personally um, identifying information. Uh, so I think I've seen some issues with the timing of releases and you might want to rethink that and I'd be glad to talk with you about it. Um, I would expect a specific ROI for case review. Yes, I would. Um, and I think that that would be limited if that case review is happening on one day. I'm just making up a date, June 15th, then it would be just for that day. If it's gonna be for two hours on that day, you can make it super narrow. Um, if that case review is gonna take a month, then the release might be for a month. Um, okay, great, great engagement. Thank you for that. It's All this stuff is important and there are challenges. Next slide, please. So some tips as we think about this, um, some of this will be a review, some of it I'll be uh, adding to points we've already discussed, things that you brought up and questions and answers in the chat that I'm incorporating. Uh, first line, please. As we've mentioned, identify the confidentiality requirements for each member of your team. And I think it's helpful for the team members to be able to explain why they have them so that it's not that doesn't give the appearance or seem arbitrary or something they're just making up, um, that there, there's a legal basis for these expectations. Next line, please. Heather um, explained a lot of great reasons for establishing the purpose and expectations for your team. But one of the reasons that has to do with confidentiality is so that you can focus on whether or not you need certain information to achieve the purpose for the team and meet expectations. Next line, please. Heather mentioned the importance of developing protocols in general about the work that the SART does. I wanna highlight some uh, confidentiality related protocols that may be useful. Um, Heather's gonna talk in a moment about redaction and how that can help. There, you also need to be clear about what you're doing with the documentation that you're gathering, whether electronic or paper, um, what your retention policies are, how you go about destroying files when you no longer need them or information. Are there things like assigning numbers that only the person who brought the case will know who you're talking about? Again, with the understanding that in certain communities, it's not gonna be that simple, but in larger communities, it might help. Um, one of you asked a great question in the question and answer, which was, what do you do when you have new members joining the SART who may not be familiar with all these discussions that you've had before? I think it's important that you think about onboarding and orientations for the members of your team so that you are able to get someone up to speed. It will do them a favor and it will help all of the members of the team to not need to explain things and rehash stuff if it can be something that you have as part of your usual rhythms with onboarding people to the team. And then one of you asked in the chat, which um, a question about what about confidentiality forms if everyone signs off on those? I think confidentiality forms where there are agreements identified among the team are useful just to make sure, I think when you're signing something and dating it, I know I tend to read it more carefully um, as a lawyer and probably already reading it more carefully than other people who aren't lawyers. But uh, I think when you're generally asked to sign something, especially if it's a simple document with not a lot of pages where you can just read the six key points that, it helps people take it more seriously sometimes. I don't know that it would be terribly binding, but I think it's helpful to set expectations. If you think you can effectively set expectations otherwise, then maybe you don't need that sort of form, but it's, it's a tool to think about um, in this context. I'm gonna pause for a second and just look at the chat. Um,
Um, I can say with regard to templates for ROIs that we have some that um, are VAWA compliant. And I would use our resource request form to request those. And I think they can be adapted to SARTs. Nigel, do you have something you want to say? Yeah, I have one question. I think this came up under your part of the conversation, but the question is, I heard that you say the case for our review to evaluate the agencies. Are there any examples of how you talk with the role of advocacy agency within a case, looking at whether a survivor had an advocate with them at different points in the process or not, et cetera? That does not impact the overall response system. I'm curious how that fits into this process. Yeah, I can I can answer that. Um, I have I think I responded back to her individual question in the chat, but uh, my response was that some teams will decide as part of their case file review that that's a piece that they specifically want to look at. So, having um, a question on their case file review form when they're reviewing cases that specifically helps them identify in that case file if a, a survivor one was. Um, had an advocate or two was an advocate um, provided, but it wasn't mentioned in the case file. So there's a couple different ways that SARTs have decided to look at that in particular. And I think it's just up to your team. Um, again, what is your why? What are you trying to look at? But also I think the toolkit that Nigel put in the chat earlier, um, and on are we making a difference has a lot of other evaluation um, ideas that you may be able to pull from if you're looking for something more specific around advocacy and law enforcement in particular. And then I think every other question you were already were able to answer, Carol. Fabulous. Keep those questions coming. I'm glad to answer them. And I think answering your questions makes things more interesting and relevant. So I encourage you to ask them freely. Next line, please. Another tip is to revisit the confidentiality protocols regularly. Um, because of turnover, but not just because of turnover, because the laws change. Uh, the laws change regularly, and especially the, the um, victim advocates' confidentiality and privilege is something that's becoming more established throughout jurisdictions and, and is being adjusted as case law starts to emerge with that. So things can shift. Um, the There were recently enacted some VAWA amendments that haven't yet gone into effect, but they broaden how uh, VAWA applies to victim services that, and legal assistance. So there are things like that that happen regularly and it's important that you have conversations about what those legal changes uh, mean for your work on the SART doing case review. And also just to make sure that everyone's still on the same page about them. Next slide, please. <laughs> And then I think it's important to develop a protocol for when there is an accidental sharing of confidential information, allowing that we all do our best with protecting this information. And there might be a time when information is shared. Know that anyone who's receiving federal, excuse me, <laughs> federal funding will have, um, is required to have a data breach process in place. So not just people receiving VAWA, VOCA, FIPSA funding, but any federal funding for their work. And how data breach is defined is something that you all would want to look into as you're developing this protocol. But just making sure that there isn't an unreal expectation that um, while you'll be doing excellent work, that you're also doing perfect work and sometimes mistakes happen. So what are you going to do when that happens? Um, Heather, you had some thoughts about redactions that I wanted yeah. an opportunity to share. Okay. Yeah. Um, one thing I wanted to mention is that some teams may want to create a guide for the reduction process. And this guide will include things such as 
who is going to be responsible for the redaction and what information will be redacted. And so when we discuss redaction, just to remind everyone, we are talking about the process of editing the text to remove that identifying information to best ensure the confidentiality. And there are some pros and cons that teams will want to discuss around redaction. And I wanted to cover just a few of those. So a few reasons why a team may want to redact, as Carol mentioned, victim service providers who receive VAWA, FIPSA, VILCA funding are required um, with the protection of personal identifying information. So that's one reason. In addition, your team may have experienced um, potential challenges associated with contacting a victim or survivor to request permission to review. Um, for instance, you may have been unable to reach the victim to request permission, or maybe you were able to reach that person, but then you realize that this could potentially be more triggering or traumatizing for that person, especially if it's been a while since this case happened and that person is trying to move on. Another item to consider for redaction is that not everyone on the SART knows who in the community has been a victim or survivor of sexual assault. So a redaction in itself protects victim survivor privacy amongst the team members as well. And redaction also allows for the ability to hold the system accountable as opposed to focusing on the specific people involved in the case. So on the flip side, there may be some reasons why your team may decide not to redact. And one of those reasons could be the cost of redaction. So the time, the money that's put into that. And depending upon how many cases your team is wanting to review, you could be looking at a significant amount of time that is required to put into the redaction process. And I think we mentioned this before briefly, but redaction requires the agency who is providing the case files to remove the information that would identify the individuals in the case. So for example, if it's law enforcement that's providing the case file, um, records personnel at the law enforcement agency may be responsible for redacting, even if they are not on the team. So that's definitely something to think about. And then if you're using Closed case files, those cases may already be classified as public information, so there may not be that need to redact that information. Um, or you may have assigned permission from the victim already to review the case. So that decreases the need to redact the victim's information. But if you are looking at this as an assessment of the entire system, you're still going to want to redact the rest of the information that's personally identified. Um, depending on the team's community, there may be additional information that teams may want to consider redacting so that that personally identifying information is not learned. And so um, I know we kind of alluded to this a little bit earlier about the rural communities, but one example I was thinking of is, um, let's say there's a case that occurred in a small town involving a woman with 11 children. The number of children alone in this case could be specific enough that it identifies this individual, especially in a small town. So in this case, the team may decide that part of their guide for redaction will include the location of all these cases so that this case in particular is not identified. And the last thing I wanna mention is that um, it's also best practice to redact any identifying information related to the responders of the case as well. And once again, that kind of keeps the focus on the response as a whole instead of individual members of specific disciplines. Thanks, Heather. There's a great question in the chat from Emily. Do you see it? I do. I'm reading it now. Excellent. That's on point. Okay, in absence of a full-time SART coordinator who typically takes ownership of redactions, do SARTs often have challenges around lack of capacity? of any members to do redactions. Okay, I think I maybe just covered that question. Hopefully, um, typically that responsibility falls on the agency who is providing the case files. So if you're asking the prosecution office to provide um, case files, it would be um, someone in the prosecution office 
And typically, you know, if you don't have a full-time SART coordinator, you, your team may want to identify um, a point of contact, somebody who's going to be helping to facilitate that redaction process. And that person, it could be anybody on your, your team, but they can just be that, that go between, between let's say the prosecution's office and your team to really figure out that redaction process. And so as a team, you're, you're trying to figure out what your guide is, what all information needs to be redacted, but then that point of contact can work with the individual at the prosecution's office who would be the one physically removing that information. Thanks. And to your last, the last part of your question, Emily, I think that capacity point is a good one, that this can be time intensive. It can take a while to do. And ideally, there's going to be a second person who's looking through before it's released to the redaction to make sure that you caught everything. Um, so yeah, I think capacity is something to be mindful of that it's not, depending on the length of the file, it can be something that would be very time intensive. Um, and so agencies, assuming the agencies are bringing the case file to for review, would need to allocate the time and resources for that. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so we're gonna allow some time. If you have any other lingering questions, now is the time to ask. Um, we're also gonna be putting an evaluation link in the chat. So please take a moment to complete the evaluation for today's training. We value your feedback, whether it's good or bad, your feedback ensures that we can continue to bring you relevant training opportunities that include content that is important to you. So please take the time to fill that out. And oh. In addition to questions, I wanted to also um, invite you to, if you have ways that you have addressed some of these challenges or questions or concerns, to feel free to share those with the group. Um, I'm looking at Nigel. Oh, did you have a question? I'm just looking at the question. Yep, I was just going to tell you there was a couple more questions that came up if you want me to read those out for you. I'm glad to to, um, to touch Kim, on Kim's the answer. Kim's at least um, you may have answered this, but would a general confidentiality form all team members sign be sufficient for a victim service provider to stay in compliance with VAWA? Um, love this question. It has so many bits to it, um, and I didn't answer it. So I think that there are reasons why a team might want to have a confidentiality form. Uh, that is signed, but that doesn't change that there's this process in place. It's not a form. It's, it's something that applies to those victim service providers who receive VAWA funding where they are required to have a conversation with the person whose information they would be sharing. And there needs to be an agreement about what information will be shared and that will be shared with this team. And then that person funded by VAWA would need to have that record that agreement and have the person whose information is released. So I see them as two different things. There's um, there are the expectations about what's going to be shared, but if a victim service provider is sharing that information in the SART, um, they are doing so because they had the conversation with the victim about that they were going to do so and what information they would share. And they would have had, I would hope, in that context of that, I'm sharing this information with law enforcement who, because of Brady or other reasons, don't have the same expectations. So when I share with this group, there are different people, some of whom won't have the same protections that I have. Are you okay with that? And if they're not, then the victim service provider isn't going to bring the information. So it's not something once that information is shared, it's, you know, like the cat is out of the bag or the beans are spilled or whatever analogy you want to use, but it's up to the victim service provider to not share that information initially without the permission. So I see it as two different things. I hope that's responsive and let me know if you want me to say more about that. 
Um, I'm not sure what the can you reshape the form to request some resources means. Um, do you know of case review process that includes cases where the crime has not been reported to police? I'm going to see that say that's a Heather question. <clears throat> yeah, no, I have not. And I would say that's typically because this process is looking at the criminal justice system. And typically the only way that's going to get started is with that initial police report. Um, I would be curious what your thoughts are. Um, if this is something your team is looking at, are you, or were you just curious if this has been done without the crime being reported? I just, in my mind, I'm thinking there wouldn't be any, um, there wouldn't be that text analysis, there wouldn't be that paper trail, nothing to look at to analyze if it was not reported to law enforcement. Nigel, would you repost the link to the resource request form? Thank you for that clarification. Um, thank you, Nigel. Uh, Heather, how would you suggest to bring up the question of implementing case reviews at SART meetings? I think that's a more of a you question. Yeah, I think um, really, I think one, I would take a look at the toolkit that we'll have Nigel put it in the chat again. It has some really helpful kind of foundational information and some ideas around how to bring this up to your team. Um, what I would suggest is even just bringing it to your team with some of those readiness questions that we discussed in the beginning to kind of assess whether your team is interested in doing this process. And uh, we've put in the chat, we will be sending all of the slides, the handout materials, and the recording um, out to all the participants after this. So if you can't remember the long list of readiness questions that we covered at the beginning, you're going to get that information. But that would be, I think, a good start to really just have an organic conversation with your team um, on kind of the trajectory of where your team is going as well. What are you currently working on? Where do you hope to be? And, and starting with that assessment. There's another point here that, um, that a team uses a team confidentiality form, a signed form um, for those that are present during a discussion that was amended to include specific guidance when conducting the discussion virtually, um, in addition to the consent obtained by various professionals on the team. I think, again, that's a great idea for making sure everyone is on the same page about what the expectations are. Um, as, you know, it should be consistent with, of course, what the legal, what the law requires. Someone indicates I'm having a difficult time getting the form to work to request the handout about different funding streams and how it impacts confidentiality. Oh, sorry about that. Form. When you open it up, it doesn't do the submit button and the format gets all weird. So should they just download the form and email it to t org? Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Um, we can also, if uh, Heather and Nigel, you're willing to send out the form with the, uh, we have it the separate form that you can send out with the yeah. post webinar material. So keep track of what you want and then fill it out when you get those materials from SVJI. That would be great. I'm so sorry that that's problematic and we'll work to fix it for the future. Um, I, okay. you go. I was just going to say, I wanted our contact information on the screen for anybody who would like to grab that um, before we end today. So I'm going to leave that up for anybody who is wanting that. Uh -huh. There's, thank you. There's a, um, a point about, which I'm not fully sure about, but is raising up victim services and hospital response, which is a great topic for SARTs, but I'm not sure how to support the particular question. I'm not understanding the start of it, but just um, excited that you're asking a question about that. Um, and then I think this last, currently last question is a Heather question. Heather, do you agree? 
Let me see. We've had several local teams not want to review real life cases. Ongoing cases cause concern for interference and close cases raise concern for re-traumatization of team members, vicarious trauma. We've been discussing an MDT subgroup to build mock cases with a variety of issues to walk through together and discuss. Yes, I think one, that is definitely why we here at SVJI recommend closed cases because um, for that exact reason, ongoing cases, it, there's a lot of different concerns around that. Interference definitely being one of them. Um, interesting point though, I have not heard um, necessarily re-traumatization of team members vicarious trauma. Um, so that is definitely something I think the MDT subgroup around mock cases could definitely help even just walking through what that process could look like. So those individuals who are a little bit more concerned about that re-traumatization um, can, can see that process kind of from start to finish and what that would look like in terms of them actually putting time in for that. My other thought is um, having a selection process of cases, maybe that wouldn't be so close to some of those individuals. So um, depending upon your why and why you're doing case review, I would be more than happy to have a more in-depth conversation with you, Kaylee. Um, if you'd like to reach out to me, we can talk a little bit more about diving a little deeper into exactly what's going on with the team to kind of strategize around some of that. And I want to, I'm really excited that you're asking about vicarious, vicarious trauma, re-traumatization of team members. Um, so important that we're thinking about that because that is real and to acknowledge it and work to address it is really important. Um, and thanks for that clarification about the uh, cases outside of police cases. That's um, that's exciting that you're doing that. Um, what other questions do you have for us? And uh, going back for a second while you're thinking about that and hopefully entering things in the chat box, you should you should feel free if you want to if there's a way you can use the uh, resource request form that you have access to without it working the way it should um, electronically. You feel free to send it to me if that's easier with my email addresses on this slide. So if that's easier for you, whatever works for you, uh, you can do that now and not need to wait for the form to come out because it will probably be the same form as I'm thinking more about that. Heather, are there any questions you have about confidentiality? Is anything I didn't no. do or go too quickly through with apologies to Caption or Joyce? <laughs> no, I think um, this has been great information. And I want to thank everybody who was on the, the Zoom today for all your participation. You've asked some really great questions. Feel free to reach out to us if, you know, this has been a lot of information to take in. So after you have some time to process. If you have questions um, around confidentiality for Carol, or if you have questions specifically for sexual assault response teams, reach out to me. Um, but we really appreciate everybody for taking the time to, to be with us today. Definitely, thank you.